Well, good morning. I am Haley Sinclair. Uh, we are at Green Acres in Tyler, Texas, and we are going through the book of Romans. And today, this is session five, and we are going to be in chapter seven through eight today. That is what we're going to be covering. So if you would take your Bibles, we're going to start in chapter seven, and then we're going to move into chapter eight. We're not going to hit all of chapter eight, even though that is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Quick story, I made my D group girls, uh, we had like three girls in my D group for four years. Well, we had, I had four different D groups, so one a year. And I made one group uh, memorize the whole chapter of Romans 8. <laughs> and they thought they couldn't do it, but we made it halfway through. But I think it is just so applicable to our lives. So I would encourage you, you know, shoot for the stars when you're memorizing the Bible because it will come in handy uh, every single day. So um, I would love to spend more time there, but as I was preparing and as I, I was praying, where should we be today? I kept going back to Romans 7. So I really wanted us to hit a few themes that are found in Romans 7 that I feel like we don't really talk about very much. So um, we're going to start Romans 7, chapter, um, chapter 7, verses 4 through 6 is where we're going to begin. But um, St. Augustine, he prayed, Give what thou commandest, and command what thou wilt. So in other words, command me, Lord, and then give me the resources, the ability, and the spirit to do what you have commanded me. And that is what I feel like Romans 7 is going to um, be worked out, okay? So last week, Debbie and Jada, they helped us to see in Romans 6 that sin no longer has dominion over us who are in Christ, right? She made the point that Paul appeals, I don't know if you remember this, but she said that Paul appeals to Christians to become in practice what they are in status. So to become in practice what they are in status. So Romans 7 is going to show us our tendency to do the opposite. Okay, it's going to show us our tendency to use the law as the means of um, becoming more like Jesus rather than dependence on the work of Christ. Okay, and so we're going to take a look at a few key passages that show us the reality of our goodness. Okay. And then we're going to see how the law is a terrible master to change our hearts and to make us into the image of Jesus. So this is so important. One reason I wanted to hit on this is because I have been in the Midwest. Coming back to East Texas was a culture shock for me. Because for the first time I saw how much we boast in our wealth, in our religious activity, um, in our appearance and in our social status. I have never quite seen it the way I saw it when I came home this, this summer. And so I feel like this is such an applicable word for us in the context that we're in because we are so eager to put our faith in, in what we look like and what we put forward. And even today as I'm teaching, I want you to be impressed with me. But that is so ungodly, right? That is, not, that is not the point of this time together. The point of this time together is that Christ would be glorified. And so I want, in, in weakness or however the Lord wants to use me today, I want you to see that it is not the law. It is not our righteousness that brings glory to the Lord. And it's not able to change your life. It will not do any good for you. And I want you to see that. I want you to see how Paul preach this to the Romans. And then I want you to walk away and be convinced of that and then show you where you do get um, the confidence to live out your Christian life. All right, so Romans 7, verses 4 through 6. Let's look together. If you have a copy of your Bible, um, I want you to, to read it. We're going to start in verse 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the old letter of the law. 
So these three verses are telling us of a new way that we relate to the Lord. Through the Spirit and not through the letter. Look at verse 4. It says, You belong to Him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So what is the point of, of all of this? That we may belong to Christ and bear fruit for Him. That we may belong to Christ and bear fruit for Him. So the big idea, I feel like, of chapter 7 is the goal of our new life is communion with God. The goal of our new life is communion with God. This fellowship that we have with God is what produces life in our life. And it also produces the fruit in our lives. So I'm going to say that again. It is not the production and the amount of fruit in our lives that gives us fellowship. So it's not what you do, it's not how well you look as a Christian or how good you're even doing as a Christian that gives you fellowship. It is, it is fellowship that produces fruit, faith that produces works. So let's look at this, Romans 7, 9 through 10, verses 9, it says, Once I was alive, wait, yes, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life again and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Obedience to God's commands cannot raise us to life. So I know that we're like, yes, I know all of these things, but functionally we really don't live this way in a lot of, in a lot of just the practical ways we think. I think that's mainly where we see it is when we begin this dialogue in our mind of when we're having a bad day spiritually. We begin to function as if our acceptance before the Lord is based on, on how well we have acted that day or how well we have obeyed God. And so I want you to see that obedience to God's commands, it can't raise us to life. We need a heart change. Rules do not change us. And the Bible says because of our sin nature, when we are given what is right to do, we will most often do the opposite. That is why when you try and you tell your children do not touch the oven. And what do they do? They touch the oven, right? But that is us. Even as adults, that is us. We just know how to, uh, to, to dress it up a little bit better. And so laws are given to those who are in need of directions. Laws are the borders that keep us safe and help us to live without the threat of going over the edge. The law, the law of God is good. And there are purposes of the law in God's Word. I want to show you something um, that really helped me. It has helped me when considering what is the law of God in the Bible. And so this is something you might not have heard. This was introduced to me a few years ago, and it's something I keep going back to, okay? So John Calvin, I don't know if you're familiar, he's an old theologian. And he introduced um, kind of, a, it's not a new concept, it's found in Scripture, but it's kind of, a, it categorizes the law, of uh, the different laws in Scripture. So there are three uses of the law, okay? You may want to write these down, and if you want to research more deeply, there is a, I'm just literally skimming over this, so it's not to the depth that it could be. But the first use, okay, the first use of God's law, it functions as a mirror, reflecting to us the perfect righteousness of God, our own sinfulness, and shortcomings. So the first use is that God's law functions as a mirror, reflecting to us the perfect righteousness of God and our own sinfulness and shortcomings. So we mainly see this in the Ten Commandments. When we read the Ten Commandments, it is a mirror for us. It is a mirror. It shows us, okay, God expects this of His people. This is what holiness is to the Lord. This is what means being holy. And then it is a mirror to us to show us this is how holy God is and this is how sinful I am because I know I cannot keep the law perfectly. So that is one function and one use of the law in the Bible. The second is the civil use. The civil use. And this is mainly used to restrain evil in the world. So though, the, I read this, it says, though the law cannot change the heart, it can be used to prevent lawlessness by its threats of judgment, protecting the righteous from the unjust. 
So this would probably be mostly like the laws of the land, um, a civil use for the law. And we see this in like the Old Testament when God gave certain laws to God's people um, that protected them from harm um, in, this, in a civil way. And then, so let's go to the third function real quick. This is the function of the law to guide the believer into the good works that God has planned for them. So it's not all bad. The law, God wants to use the law in the life of the believer to guide us into good works that God has planned for them. So in Romans 7, I hold that Paul is probably most likely talking about the moral law here, um, which is most fully expressed in the Ten Commandments. Um, but we're going to see what the problem is, okay? And this is going to lead us to the real problem, is our problem with the law is that we like to live on the edge. Each one of us, regardless of our stage of life, um, we are given to self-destructive tendencies. We're all one choice away from running our lives. I don't care how old you are or how young you are, this is the tendency, this is the, the curse of the human heart and the sin that reigns in us is that we in one moment can run our lives with one bad choice, no matter how good we have lived up to that choice. And so I want you to see that... Um, the whole chapter is pointing us to the real problem. And the real problem, it's not the law. The law is good. The real problem is not the Lord. The real problem is sin. The real problem is sin. Look at Romans 7, verses 14 through 17. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin. For I do not understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. So look at what, look at what he says. He says, because I do not practice what I want to do. That is a key phrase in that, in that particular verse. Because people who are not Christians, those who have not been truly saved, they do not care about pleasing the Lord. They do not care about pleasing their Lord. They have no true desire to worship Him and to please Him. They want to please maybe their family members, their co-workers. They want to look good to others. They want to please their children. They want to please those who they have placed on a pedestal. But they don't want to truly, in their inward being, please the Lord. So Paul is saying that this type of person, this Christian, there is this wrestle, right? They have a desire. They want to do good. They, they see that the law is good, and they, they want to try and do it. But then what does he say? Look at Romans 18 through 20. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I do not want... I am no longer the one that does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. I love this verse. When I was um, 13, really up until I was about 21, I wrestled with a besetting sin in my life. And God used this verse to comfort me on so many days because I would find myself just struggling. And I would knew I did not want to give in to that sin, but I, 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 I would have my time with the Lord this morning and then by the evening I would have failed and I'd be like what in the world is wrong with me well this is what's wrong with me is I had the desire to do what was good and I had this wrestle within me but I did the good I did the bad that I did not want to do but the promise and the beautiful thing about this verse is that last part it is the sin that lives me in me it is no longer I the one who does it but it is the sin that lives in me so there is an inner battle raging within every single one of us right our wrestle with sin looks like these verses and so you may have woken up this morning you may have had a really godly desire I want to serve the Lord in this or I want to do this I want to I want to be joyful in, in every circumstance that I face today. I don't want to, to yell at my children today. And then by the end of the day, you'll probably get in bed and say, well, I did it again. 
because that is our tendency. And Paul knows this. The Lord knows this. And we have to get to the place. We have to get to the place of seeing what really does make us victorious over sin. And it's not us just navel gazing. It's not us looking at the law and just constantly dwelling on who we're not. It is the process of dwelling on who we are. And so look at Scripture. It, it makes a very clear distinction of self from sin. Okay, You might want to write that down, that there is a distinction here from self and sin. Okay, So the Bible is separating the two. Now, before we're saved, we are sinners before God. That is who we are, right? That's not just what we do. That is who we are. But then when God redeems us and we put our faith in Jesus, what do we become? We become saints in His sight. So how many times a day do you say, oh, I'm just a sinner? That's not true. That is not true. You are a saint in the eyes of God who sins. And so that is a helpful Listen to your language, listen to how you talk, and listen to the things that you say. It reflects what you most often believe. And that is not true. You are not a sinner. You are a saint in God's eyes. Ephesians 1 is a great reference for that if you would like to um, dwell on that some more. So when we act hypocritically and when we act against the good we want to do, we remember that that is sin and that is not self. So look at verse 21. Paul says, I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present within me. I have often thought of this verse, um, especially when I'm set out to do something good, especially like leading a Bible study, okay? I think, I, I know that uh, I want to do this really good thing, but I also have to remember that evil lies so close. What is uh, what, Hebrews 12? The, the sin that clings so closely, we have to fling that off. But we also have to be aware that that's there. Like that is something that is wanting to get in the way of what God has put us, called us to do this week, today. There is something God has called you to do today. Beware that evil is present. When you have a desire to do something good, evil is close and it is present with you. So Paul, in verse 24, after just going through and explaining to those in the Romans, uh, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? He's, he's just exasperated. And I think that we all understand that feeling of just being exasperated. And I think maybe even some of you today have that feeling of just being tired being overwhelmed with your sin, your failures, your inability to do what is right the way that you want to do it. And Paul is saying, praise God. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I really pray that the, the Word of God, wherever you are today, will just blow a fresh wind in your sails where you're tired, where you're discouraged, and that we will get our eyes on Jesus and be encouraged. Look at this story I read this week, um, and I just thought, this is so perfect. So I was reading an old book by, his name is F.B. Meyer. You might not have heard of him. It's actually, yes, okay, good, I love that. That makes me happy. Uh, I actually found this book while I was cleaning, and I was like, what is this book? And I picked it up, and I was like, oh. My grandfather gave me this book. I don't remember when. That's just the story of my life. But I do. I picked it up, and I read this, this ending portion of this little bitty book. And he tells a story. And I want to read that to you real quick. I kind of changed some of the old language because it was kind of hard to read. But just do your best to listen. It says, or he says, in Ireland, a friend of uh, in Ireland, a friend once went to call on what we call a decayed Irish nobleman. That is, he had seen better days. He had a title and was the owner of a large piece of land. My friend passed by the house and proceeded to go up to it, but found there was only a housekeeper there. It was a lovely place, but she said that her master, the nobleman, might be found at the gate lodge which he had passed. 
My friend found that he was stricken with a strange disease which led him to think that he had no money at all. And in order to economize, he deserted his magnificent home, which he could well keep up and live in the lodge. It was a strange thing to do, wasn't it? But it is what you have been doing all your life. God meant you to live a royal life, and he put into Jesus Christ everything to enable you to live that life. You have seen the plan, and you have not dared to realize it because you thought you had not enough capital. But in Jesus Christ, God has put the fullness of his possession. If ever God puts me forward to new responsibility, I always go back to him on an honorable understanding that he will give me more of his help. He put into Jesus Christ everything to enable you to live that life. That's what he says. I love that. That leads us to Romans 8.1. We're just going to touch on this for just a second. We're almost done. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 2. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What a relief. Praise God that this is the case. When we're burdened by sin, this shows us how we commune with God. Sam Alberry once said about Romans 8, he says, we need to keep hearing this on repeat because what we will do otherwise is drift into this way of thinking that says, I have to look good as a Christian so that Jesus looks good. I know we have all had that thought. I have to look good as a Christian so that Jesus looks good. Whereas Romans 8.1 is saying, no, I don't have to look good in order for Jesus to look good. I have to be honest about my colossal spiritual need so that Jesus can look sufficient. So that Jesus can look sufficient. That kind of flips the way we think about our Christian life on its head, doesn't it? Uh, you may be wondering the word condemnation. We don't really talk about that very much. We don't use that language. Um, it is a Greek word, katechema, and it means just to pronounce sentence on. So you may want to write that down. Condemnation means to pronounce sentence on. It's a le legal decision of guilt in a criminal case. So no longer is there a sentence of death upon our lives. No dread. So we get to look at Jesus. We get to look and see what he's done for us. And we also see a new phrase. Let's look at verse 2. It says, the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life. So if you have your Bible, turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 through 34. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 through 34. I'm going to go ahead and start reading it. This is what Jeremiah says, and he's prophesying, and he says, Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration, for I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. This is a new law, a new law written on our hearts by the Lord himself, and he says, They shall all know me. They shall all know me. The goal of our new life and be given a new heart is communion with God. So part of um, my story is that when I was a young girl, my father passed away from colon cancer. He was diagnosed when I was seven, and then at the age of ten, he passed away. Um, and I did not realize that this would begin a very unhealthy dialogue um, in my mind and in my heart. And I really didn't realize that until I got older. It was really just a dialogue of just distrusting the Lord. Um, it, it accused him of just being a God who takes and takes and not being a God who's generous and who gives. Um, 
so much so that um, when I was about to get married to my husband, I, I almost couldn't even accept his proposal because I thought, this is too good. Um, and I thought, surely the Lord's going to take this away. Um, I thought it was just too good to be true. Um, I really questioned the generosity and goodness of God. But then it was in that very same season where that really manifested itself that the Lord gave me a promise, as He always does. And it was Psalm 8411, which said, No good thing will He, will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And as a young girl, I was 19, I thought, wow. That is so true. That is so true. And this began to dismantle um, a really deeply held belief that God was against me having anything good. But it also reframed my understanding of what good really is. It really began to help me see what is good. Well, it's anything that the Lord gives. Look at verse 31 through 32 in Romans 8. 31, 32. Paul says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare His own Son, but offered Him up for us all. How will He not also with Him grant us everything? So I thought God was being stingy. I thought, the Lord just takes and takes. He doesn't want me to have anything good. But if we ever began to think about that, we need to look at the cross. We need to look back at Jesus, and one look at the cost of His love really silences these, these thoughts and this train of thinking. He did not even spare His own Son, but offered Him up for us all. The highest good is God Himself. He is the highest good. And there is not one thing, there is not one person, not one place that is a higher good than He. And to have the Son of God come to us in all of His goodness and take my place because of my sinfulness, why would the buck stop short in any area of my life? Why would the buck stop short? Why would He be hesitant to give me something good if He gave Jesus His one and only Son for me? That's a very simple truth. But maybe think about that today. Like, let that dwell richly in your heart as the Scripture says. All right, so we have got to start rejoicing in the generosity of God. And when the day doesn't go as planned, or life turns sour, and Romans, gonna, Romans 8 talks about suffering. I hate that we're not hitting on that, but we can rest assured that God's not holding out on us. We go back to His Word and we see, He, how will He not also with Him grant us everything? He has already shown us that He would give us Jesus. All right, last, last thing we're going to cover. We're almost done, y'all. Verses 33 uh, through 34. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. But even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. So what is Paul's rebuttal? to those accusations that we often live in, that, that tendency that we have to live in a condemned state, his answer is Jesus. His answer is Jesus. He answers his questions, not with his work. He answers his questions and this, these feelings of condemnation and these feelings of accusations with the work of Jesus. Not one time will you hear who who is the one who condemns? You have been reading your Bible every day. You have not been selfish lately. You have not had a lustful thought in a while. No. No. Why would, he, why would we challenge the work of Jesus by thinking we can offer anything to God? We cannot, and he's already made it very clear in Romans 7. So when we allow the good news to penetrate our lives, we will actually begin... This is really what I want to end on. We will actually begin to experience obedience that comes from a cheerful heart. And we will begin to walk in step with the Spirit because this is the way that Jesus walks. To follow the Spirit means to follow the Son. And in doing so, we live lives that honor our Father. And this is how we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. So Romans 7 and Romans 8, it intersects with real life. I really just wanted you to see that today. We know the law. 
We know what God says to do. We know our inability to carry it out. And this is real life. This is real life to look away from ourself and to look to Jesus. And that's my encouragement to y'all today. I'm so thankful that um, I get to express that to you because I need to remember that. And as a teacher, we learn way more than, than y'all who are sitting and listening. But I want to encourage you to look at Jesus. This is the only way to live victoriously, to not just look at him, but look long at Jesus. Look and think about what he's done for us. And remember those things that you have once forgotten. And I'm going to end with this quote from John Piper. He says, wherever you look in scripture, look to Jesus. Let every passage tell you something of his father and his spirit and thus himself. Make it your aim in all your use of the scriptures to see and to savor more of Christ. Be on a treasure hunt to satisfy your soul more and more in Him. In this way, the Spirit of Christ will be at work to transform you into His image. The aim of the law will be fulfilled more and more in your life, and you will magnify Christ in your life until He comes to complete the work He has begun. All right, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for this time. I just pray that... Um, every true word that was spoken that um, that Lord that the enemy would not take away and steal from our hearts Lord I pray that you would glorify yourself in the way that we walk away from this time together um, as you work out these truths in our hearts and would we just hold more tightly to you Jesus thank you Lord for this opportunity today to share thank you for Jesus who is our hope in life and death thank you God that um, you are good to us, and you are generous. And I just thank you, Lord, for this time together. May you be continually glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.